This is the Auto Body Podcast, presented by Clarity Co. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today we have Daniel on from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He is the business service manager at Zimmerman Auto Body Supplies and the C20 Refinish Moderator at Collision Hub. Um, Daniel's doing some pretty cool things. He, Daniel, I didn't ask you this, but how old are you? I'm 37. I will be 38 in April. So I'm like 37 and I don't know, whatever we call it, seven eighths or something. <laughs> I was going to, I was actually thinking that you were younger than that. You look young for 37, man. You look good. That's because I don't have, I, it's, I have dogs and no kids. <laughs> Can confirm. Can confirm. I think. I think. Um, I think that's the, the secret. We were uh, before we started the podcast. We were just talking about um, Pennsylvania and how they're actually having a nice winter and have like zero snow. And then here last week we got in South Dakota. We got like twenty plus inches, and it's been a miserable couple of weeks. So I'm happy for you. Thank you. Not I, really. I appreciate that. But <laughs> I'm, I'm um, not happy for you. <laughs> I finally got to use my snowblower and like really put it to the test. So I guess, <laughs> I, I guess that's great. That's great. <laughs> um, okay. So Daniel, uh, talk to me about like, um, what young Daniel was like, how you got into this crazy industry. Um, cause I think you have a pretty neat and interesting story. So, uh, kind of tell people how you got into it. Yeah. It's, it's like a really bizarre, um, it's, it's kind of strange. Like, so when I was in high school, um, I did really well. I was on honor roll and uh, I did like super good in school. And my dad was a lot older when I was born. Like he was born in uh, 37, I was born in 85. So like he was 48 when he had me. So it's, it's pretty old to have, to have a, a kid. And um, you know, he had, you know, being born in 37, he was like tail end of, of, you know, really tough times for this country. So he had a different, you know, state of mind than, than, you know, kids I went to school with, with their parents, because I didn't grow up with a, uh, you know, a parent that went to college or anything like that. And even though I worked hard in, in school, my dad was kind of like, look, you know, uh, it, it's super important to do well and, you know, to be as smart as you can and learn as much as you possibly can. But like, there's no money for you, you know, to go to college or anything like that. And initially, like my strengths in high school were, were accounting, um, like super, super good at accounting. And uh, I had some, a lot of public like speaking type classes. So I initially wanted to be an attorney and then followed up like with an accountant. Like that's what I wanted to do. And, and back then, like I graduated high school in um, 03 and uh, I, I was playing golf and did, did really well in golf and, and had a, a partial, partial scholarship there and wound up breaking my leg and lost that. So there was no, there was no money for me unless I was going to take on, you know, college debt and loans and stuff and, and being blessed with a dad uh, who talked me out of that, like, look, it's not really something that, that you want to do. So, you know, at 16 years old, I was always super into cars. Like I just, I always loved cars. Um, when I was young, it's all I cared about. Like when I was 16, it was, it was work and uh, school and cars, it's like, it's all I cared about. I didn't party, I didn't do anything like, I wasn't a wild man, I just cared about cars. So a friend of my dad's had a body shop and I just thought it was like super fascinating that you would take a wrecked car and then like fix it. I couldn't understand how that worked. So, it, you know, at like 14, 15, I was like kind of hanging around, you know, the shop and it, it intrigued me. And then I got to the point where, like I just became that kid that like, just would always hang around your shop. And back in those days, it's like I swept floors, I watched them tape cars. And so it, it, when I got my license, I was able to physically drive like back and forth from the shop. So I worked in a grocery store. I worked in this little independent shop where I just learned how to wet sand. I learned how to tape cars up and spray primer. And I just really fell in love with it. So, you know, I got through high school and um, at the end, I'll never forget this. Like the, my senior year, my guidance counselor said, what are you going to do? Like when you're, when you're done. And I was like, well, I'm going to go to Stevens trade for a collision repair. And, and he said, why would you ever do that? You know, with as, as good as you do in school, you want to go work on cars. And I'm like, well, my dad just told me to do what I want to do. And I want to fix cars and I think it's cool. And I, I want to paint cars. So they all try to talk me out of it and they couldn't do it. So, um, I went to Stevens trade, which is a local school for me. And, went there for for two years and the whole time 
I had worked at uh, a dealership and an independent as, uh, as a, a painter, prepper, and then I got my estimating license. So like when summers were, were in, I would be full time. And then uh, when I was at Stevens two year school, I would work in the evenings and weekends. Like I just was, I was, if I wasn't at school, I was either working in a shop, I worked as a server for a little bit, like whatever I had to do to pay my tuition and whatever it took to keep learning the trade is what I did. So I graduated, I was like, I think I just turned 20. I graduated from Stevens worked at uh worked at a, a dealership as a painter and then wound up going into a restoration shop for a while and then back to an independent but the whole my whole time i always worked i always worked in two shops i never just worked in one so like i'd work at one from like eight to five i'd work at another one in the evenings and then i worked at like you know weekends whatever it took so i was always working in a shop in different different aspects of a shop so when I was 21, unfortunately, you know, my, my dad passed away and I started to kind of figure out like, okay, so what do I want to, what do I want to do here long term? And I kind of stayed full time at the dealership and, and then it, it just, it, the, the pace of it at the time was, it, it was too hard for me to deal with that and like dealing with my dad's passing, it was too hard. So I went to this independent shop and something super cool. We, we did a lot of heavy trucks and we did, you know, collision repair and I was doing estimating, I was doing painting and we actually painted the uh, truck that carried the very first piece of the World Trade Center Memorial. It took us like nine months mm -hmm. to restore this truck. And like, if you, there's a picture of it on my Instagram, but like there's an eagle going down the side with an American flag. And then there's like on the one fuel tank, it's got the fireman putting the, the uh, flag in the grounds. And then the other side is the Statue of Liberty, like this really elaborate paint job. So, um, you know, we were doing all that stuff and, and um, it was a great shop. I loved it. And 2009, my, my old teacher from Stevens, him and I were super close. He called and said, look, I got to do a sabbatical. Would you want to come in here and, and teach? And I'm like, look, I can teach or finish, but like, I'm not, I can't, I don't, I don't fix cars. Like I don't do structural repairs. I can put bumpers on, I can fix, you know, scratches, dings, stuff like that. But if you put me on a frame rack, I'm going to total the car. That's still true to this day. I don't, I don't touch structural vehicles. So they brought me in. I taught for um, an entire semester. And so I would teach from seven to 11 and then go back to the shop and then work from 12 to eight. So I did it for like a good, I don't know, five months or however long it was. And at that time, I had met um, a paint rep that worked for BASF because I had used BASF products and, and they worked really well for me. And he said, look, you know, Pennsylvania is getting ready to go waterborne. If it's something that you would be interested to do is come, come work for us as a tech rep. So I thought about it and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So um, I thought, you know what, this, this is probably a, a cool opportunity. So 2009, I, uh, I took a job as a, a BASF tech rep and really the the from 2009 until about 2017 in Pennsylvania, I did like all the demos, the installations, the trainings for the BASF waterborne line. And like, it was just like, really, it's like, it's so strange when you look back, I look back at my career, like I didn't, I never picked some of these things to have happened that that I wound up getting involved with. So like, probably like 2016, 2017, I got involved with the BASF marketing department and um, I started like developing colors for some of their builders. So I started working with like KC, the guy that used to be on Gas Monkey Garage, Jonathan Goolsby. They had this all girls uh, build through um, through Bogey, who, who is all girls garage. I did a, a, a color for um, Rutledge Wood for an eBay Motors build. I started doing like all this like really interesting stuff. and. Then Kristen and I met from Collision Hub because um, I went out to Arkansas to film some BASF virtual certification videos. And so got a relationship with her. And then through my jobber that I work for, I said, look, you know, you ever get on the road and do like some of these classes, you know, that you're doing now, but in person. And they had done them like at SEMA, but never, never uh, on the road. So we brought them out and we did it. And then like COVID hit and she said, would you be interested in, and in, I'm going to start these 20 groups. Would you want to run my, uh, my paint side of things? So I did that and, uh, we, you know, I've been doing that for the last couple of years. So um, it's kind of cool because I have no shops all over the country and work with Larry Montanez frequently up in New York and, and Jason, who is, is Kristen's kind of like head guy over there, just the relationships have been huge and just meeting all these different shop owners and painters, 
you know, they just want to be the best of the best has been super cool. So like, I mean, that's in a, in a nutshell, there's a, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the way it's gone for me. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a bunch of opportunities. Like I just worked this past SEMA, I did a presentation with SCRS and the DEG and, um, and BASF. We did a, a modern uh, paint class at, at SEMA, which went exceptionally well. So it's cool, you know, it's, it's nice to have a, this huge network of people, whether it be, you know, DEG, SCRS with Aaron, BASF, Axe Nobel, who I work with, Sherwin, um, the different manufacturers, you know, 3M, Norton, St. Cobain, like it's just, it's cool how big my network has gotten over the years just from meeting all these people. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's, I mean, if you want to talk for hours, we certainly can. That makes my job very easy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm curious. Okay. So, um, lots of different questions here. <clears throat> what was it like doing, going from the field and teaching, uh, sorry, what was it like going, being in the field for a couple of years and, and, and doing what you do and then going into schools and like teaching kids? Like, what was that experience for you? Like, so I think what was like really interesting is like I, I had to retract way back i mean when i was so my dad was super old school he owned a business and when i was old enough to walk he made my brother and i like come in and start like doing stuff in the business so i started working really young and then when i was 10 i got a paper route and you know would converse with like our neighbors and stuff like that and and um then i wound up uh, getting a, a, I started caddying when I was a teenager. So I would like caddy and do this paper route. Like I've had two jobs for as long as I could, could potentially remember. And, you know, through those experiences as a young person and being around predominantly adults my entire life, it gave me a different perspective because I always loved learning. So when I was caddying and I would learn stuff from the doctors and lawyers and accountants and business owners, I learned a lot of stuff from them and I appreciated them putting time into teaching me. My dad taught me a lot of stuff. And so I always loved learning. And when I, when I got into this field, like for me, I'm level 1000 or I'm not interested in doing it. So I, when I was 16, 15 years old, started getting dabbling in this business. Like I was all in, I mean, I was reading as much as I could buying collision repair books. Like I was obsessed with it because I wanted to be the greatest version of a tech that I could possibly be. And since I, I think what's interesting is if you really, really love to learn, and at least in my case, it made me love to teach. So when they, I had a great teacher at Stevens, um, Frank Patrol, unfortunately he passed away a few years ago, but he was an awesome teacher. And I loved the way that he went about instructing his students. So I always spent a lot of time with him and when he called me and asked me, you know, hey, would you want to come in and do this? And you got to, you know, do these interviews and background checks and all this stuff. It wasn't even like a hesitation. I was like, yeah, I can, I can do that. And um, I think the thing that is hard about it, and this is a, you know, for a teaching perspective going into a school, I never once thought I would be, a, you know, teach in a school. The thing I didn't like about it was the politics, and I learned that real fast, like. There's these upper level politics that trickle down. And I was kind of like, look, I'm not built for this. I mean, I'm here to teach these, you know, young adult males to learn a craft and a trade to help them, you know, make a successful living for their families. I'm not about the, the politics. And so I think what had happened was I, I was bitten by that bug so hard of taking a kid that, you know, had some decent hand skills but taking them to the next level and like doing exceptional paint jobs at a young age. And when they had asked me to come on and be this, you know, trainer tech rep, it just felt like a natural migration because I had this, you know, this last, you know, not a year, but I think it was, it was like, it was, it was probably five months that I spent teaching in the, in the school atmosphere. And I liked it so much that migrating into a tech role was easy. The thing that was that I wasn't prepared for was like I was 25 and when I was 25, I probably looked like I was like 17. So I'm going into these shops 
with guys that were double my age and the first thing they say is have you ever painted a car and I'm like, I mean, yeah, like, I, I, of course I've painted cars. Like, why would you think I have They're like, throw the gun and, at you and they're like, prove it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So, like, I remember the first, like, my first go around at, at training, we had a local shop in Lancaster. It was a dealership. It's called Lancaster Lincoln Mercury. It was the first waterborne conversion that we did. And I went in there. It was the three-man paint team. All these guys were way older than me. And, and. I said, look, I'm just going to be 100% transparent with you guys. I know this computer system. I know these undercoats. I know these clears. I know the color match process for the way that this, this company runs. I don't know this base coat because I don't know Waterborne. So I talked to the, the manager and said, this is what I would like to do. Let me help them with the computer system, undercoats, clears, picking the right variants, uh, all that stuff, but let me paint cars alongside of them and just let them split all the hours that I produce because I have to learn this base coat essentially just like they do. Because Waterborne then for us was so new, nobody had real hardcore field experience. So I spent two weeks in this shop and I just painted car after car after car after car. And by like the fifth car I painted, I'm like, this is not that much different than solvent. And um, so I, I, I got it really quick. And then it got me, you know, it kind of got me on the right path with those guys. And then I adopted that model of if I have to go in and do a training, I'm just going to paint cars with these guys. I'm not going to be the guy standing outside in, you know, in a button down shirt. Like, I'm just going to paint cars with you. And I think that there's a ton of value in that. And, and for guys that are tech repping now, it's like you, you got to get in there with them, help them tape cars up, help them prep, have conversations with them. So I think that that migration for me, that really helped a lot to, to teach kids and then flip it because there's guys now that are 40 years old and I'm 25 and I got to teach them. It's just, and I said, guys, look, I, I'm not here to teach you how to paint cars. You know how to do that. I'm not, I'm not your Votech instructor. I'm here to teach you a paint system. And I always stuck by that. Like I, you, you chose this as your profession. You know what you're doing. And I am just here to show you how to use this, uh, this paint line. And I think that worked really well. So to this day, I enjoy it. Like I enjoy getting on the C20 group and doing my monthly classes and, and teaching those guys. It's just, it's something I love doing. I love working with people and, and I still learn. I mean, I learn from other painters and other distributors and, and other paint manufacturers. Like I like to be able to get that knowledge and, and pass that on to, to the next generation. Did you, so after that first initial shop, which, I imagine that you probably garnered a lot of respect from those guys because you were just upfront transparent with them and said, Hey, like I'm kind of in the same situation as you guys. I might know a little bit more of the technical side um, and technical info of this stuff than you guys do. However, like technical info only goes so far. Like and that you, then you have to actually spray it. Right. Right. Um, but you getting in there and, and getting some booth time with them and spraying right beside them or whatever and them seeing and you guys kind of going through the same challenges together if there were challenges um i'm sure that was a hell of a lot more respectful from um you got a lot more respect from them on that than you going in there and saying hey it's basically the same just here's the stuff you should be fine just hit me up if you have problems i'm out and then just leave right oh for um, sure the next couple of shops that you did though did you run into a lot of guys that were just really resistant to the process of going from solvent to water and you know just called you out a bunch or anything like that what was what was that experience like for you so we you know in the early days of water um we did a lot of a lot of backdoor research to make sure that we set, set these guys up for success so like we would go in, we would test their air, have conversations with the painters, look at their mixing rooms. It's all about, it was about, you know, getting off on the right foot with these guys because this is a major culture change. It didn't matter if they were staying within, you know, that particular brand's paint and just switching to water or switching brands to us and going to our water, which is a, a whole different process. Um, but basically, you know, it was all about, like, I, I hate buzzwords or just like, I don't like cliche buzzwords, but it, it, back then, you know, it was all about transparency because 
you know, I always took it very seriously. Like this guy in this shop, whether he's a flat rate painter, an owner, uh, whatever it is, like this guy needs this paint to put food on his family's table. And I take that very seriously. And for me, you know, I always wanted to find out what the concerns were up front. So like, you know, what, what are you most nervous about? What are you most excited about? And that's, that was the important steps to take. And I still think that's important steps to take when, when you're dealing with someone who doesn't know you, they don't know who I am. They've never seen me before. They don't know if I can paint. They don't know if I just went to college and applied for this job. And now I have it because I was, you know, whatever the, my backstory is. So when, when it came, when it came down to, to the shops there afterwards, what I would like to do is, is I would go in and like, it didn't matter if they were just changing from solvent to water in the line or going from brand to brand. It's like, let's do a couple demos. Let's paint cars together. It gives me time to get to know you. You get to know me. You can see before this paint even hits your shop that I'm capable of, of troubleshooting for you, fixing colors for you, uh, all that stuff. So you really got to build, the whole thing is about building trust before you even go in. And then once we would do the install, it's like, refresh the mixing room this is their home away from home these guys are spending 50 hours a week here so you know what do they need to make their work life a better place to be so it's it's more than just the stuff inside the can anybody can sell you good paint i mean it's everybody makes good paint people that say that the that someone else's paint is junk is not it's just not true where's the um where's the things outside of that that that's what matters to to me so I would always try to go in and find out what they need and what their expectations were and just set them up for, for success because I understand their concerns because I'm still a painter at heart. I mean, I, I still paint now. Me and a guy that I used to work with, we paint boats. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be a painter forever. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, so you're you're a rep for um you still are a rep going around selling paint um working with shops and everything like that and then um uh who was the sorry if i'm forgetting but who was the gal that you met from collision hub it was, it was uh, Kristen felder who, yep Kristen felder um how did that um relationship kind of come around so there, there's a, a a lady that works for BASF. She's she's the she runs their marketing for the, the refinish side. Her name is Tina Nellis, and I met Tina Nellis. It was like really bizarre. Um, it was probably like 2015 or so. She she was into power boats, and I was, and I was like painting power boats, and I'd done a whole bunch of like crazy power boat projects. And I had always used BASF on all these paint jobs. So she called me and said, Hey, my husband and I are buying this cigarette boat and I'm kind of looking for some input on, on products and, and what to use. So, because she was marketing and you know, her technical team at the time was, you know, they're very much for finished. And like, I, I love going outside of the realm of normalcy. So I'm like, well, this is how I do all the boats with BASF and this is how they've always worked. And so her and I got this like super cool relationship. And then she would start calling me randomly for like just technical stuff that that was outside of the realm of automotive or finish, AKA like collision repair. So like a lot of the stuff that these builders would do, there's no technical data on it because it's essentially breaking all the rules of standard collision repair. So I would tell her like, yeah, you can use this clear to do that. And uh, this primer surface works really well. So when her and I got this relationship going, um, we were at Northeast Trade Show in like 2015 or 16. And that's when Casey Matthew had left Gas Monkey Garage. And she said, hey, he's gonna be here. Uh, he's thinking about going to BASF. Can you come have dinner with us? So my wife and I, we were up there. We had dinner with him and him and I hit it off really well. And so he said, look, I wanna make this switch, but I want you to come out and be the one to train me. So I'm like, well, look, I don't know if I can do that. I gotta run it by Tina. So 
we figured it all out. I flew out to um, to Dallas and we did a, a bunch of paint jobs with, with Onyx at the time with Casey. And so then he would fly me out there a couple times a year and he had, his YouTube channel at the time was like on fire because he was putting a lot of effort into it. So I would fly out and him and his guy, Eric, like we would film all kinds of stuff. There's a guy named Ron Cohn that used to work, he was in a show called Mob Steel or Detroit Speed with Mob Steel. And so him and I would go out and then like we would, you know, do all kinds of, of stuff for the YouTube channel. We did a bunch of instructional videos. And Kristen and I had met because um, once again, like she was doing a lot of the, the marketing and, and teaming up with BASF. So her and I got to know each other really well. And um, so her and I just made this, made this great relationship out of the gate because, you know, she grew up as, in a body shop and painting. And like I essentially grew up body shop and painting. And, um, you know, she would call me for one-off questions and I would call her for like one-off questions. And then we would see each other at trade shows. And, um, yeah, I mean, it just, the, the relationship just kind of slowly grew over time. And then once I flew out, like they needed somebody to go out to film these training videos and build the storyboard for, um, the BASF recertification videos. And Tina was like, look, I really want you to do this. Can you do it? Um, so I flew out and I did it and it was kind of cool because even though I was a, a technical person for BASF through this job or I wasn't BASF employed. So I had a little bit of more wiggle room, um, because I wasn't like strangle held by a manufacturer. And I would say, look, this is the recommendation that I'll make to you because I know that this works, but you're not going to see this in writing. When you work for a manufacturer, you can't do that stuff. So like, you know, 3M or Norton or somebody may know one of those tech guys may know factually that this process works, but unless it's been run through the ringer by the chemists and the laboratories, like they can't go out and tell you to do that. So I'll say like, hey, prerequisite, this process has worked for me for the last 10 years and I know this works, but just understand that this is not a warranted system where BASF doesn't recognize the ability to do this. Like I'll give you an example. A lot of your builders, they'll put on five or six coats of clear back to back and they'll start, like when you see a super straight car that just looks like a mirror, a lot of people think they keep sanding them and you're clearing them. That's not what happens. They put a ton of clear on, they start blocking that clear down with like 400 grit and they guide coat between steps. Well, if you try to put three coats of clear on, you're after the second step of standing, you're, you're through it. So we kind of figured out, okay, what BAS of products can I take to that limit to allow them to do this, where I can put seven coats on potentially and use this clear like a body filler where I'm going to level it and then polish it up. So that's where I got involved where, you know, I knew how far to take it. And then Kristen and I, um, you know, just, well, we like to break the rules a little bit, but then also stay in line. Interesting. So how did the, how did the 20 group part of it come around then? So I, I can't remember if I think it might, I think she was working on it right before, right before COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, it was like, all right, that, like this thing needs to happen because there are people that are stuck at home for X amount of weeks or months or whatever. Um, I think it was, I think it was pre COVID. I, I don't want to say the wrong information and say something wrong, but I think it caught maybe caught more fire then because like we, we had to do this, but she had called me one day and said, would you be interested in, she's like, I'm gonna start this, this, the C20 group. We're gonna have an owner's group. We're gonna have an estimator's group. We're gonna have a technician's group. We're gonna have a painter's group. Would you be interested in running the painter's group? So we talked a little bit about it and, and I'm like thinking, man, how am I gonna do this? Like, you know, with my job, because this is, you know, develop the information and make the PowerPoints. Like this is a, this is a big venture to, to take on. And it's if I do job. this, yeah, I wanna, I wanna do it really well. So, um, you know, I thought I, I really don't want to have to do this, you know, uh, evenings and weekends because I'm already doing my own stuff, with, you know, kind of like that. And, and how could I potentially do this? So um, I worked out a, a deal with her to where um, I basically do it on on the company time that, that I work for now. And then I use those modules that I build for Collision Hub to do training for my local customers and our sales team and our tech team. So that's kind of how it happened. And it's interesting, like if you would look back in on the World Fair, there's a um, Collision Hub did a World Fair for a couple of years and they're, they're probably gonna keep doing them. But the first one we flew out, me and uh, a couple of the guys from SADA flew out there 
and um, we did we did one. We used a couple of my uh, presentations and did we did this presentation that I built. It was a four four part presentation on essentially color, and it was all about light sources and Kelvin and CRI ratings, and it was about um, the chemistry and adjusting color. I mean, it was intense to where like it 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 got a lot of publicity because no one had ever looked at color and color theory to this magnitude and um it, it really it, i think it really took that group and caught that group on fire because people were like wait a minute this isn't stuff i'm going to read in fender but i'm not going to read this in body shop business like this stuff is this information is way out there i was very blessed to have you know with my relationships with some of the paint companies that i'd run into weird situations where it's like why does this happen in a shop like okay we know the generic term of okay the, the solvent was trapped or whatever but like what is the chemical reason this stuff happens? So I started integrating in these classes a lot of chemistry-based training. Um, in high school, I was obsessed with, with chemistry. Like it was chemistry and, and accounting were, were huge for me. And so when I started accessing these chemists and they're telling me this stuff and then I would start researching it, it like blew my mind. So when you would look at the C20 group, the refinished class, the refinished class that we do now, um, a lot of it is, it really is chemistry-based because these guys, these guys want to be the absolute best of the best and they don't want to just have elementary education. They want to know, like they almost want it to be too much. Like this is, this is, this is too far. This is too deep. That's what they want. Um, and, and that's what we do. So I think that's the interesting thing about this, the, the refinish group is that there is so much um, information there that takes, like I know that the, the four part series I did on color I have a hundred hours of research in making that class. Um, yeah, it, it's really intense. So that's not just like me Googling Man. things. That's me calling chemists and people from 3M and calling, I called light manufacturers because I had to understand the difference between, okay, well, what about, I hear about lumens and Kelvin, but like, okay, now we have CRI. Now we have spectral curves. Now we have wavelengths and nanometers. Like I needed to understand all this stuff at a super high level so that I could build a presentation that made these painters understand, you know what, there is way more to me looking at a color. But if I understand the technicality of looking at color and I simplify it in my paint shop, and now I don't have color problems anymore, or my color problems are super far between, like I don't even really think about it because I built processes around it. That's what we tried to do. And um, we just took it, we just took it to a a level that was so far out there that it's i don't to this day i don't know anybody else that's doing the stuff that we're doing in that group hey guys adam from the podcast i hope you are enjoying today's episode just wanted to ask you a quick favor if the show has brought you value in some way would you mind giving us a review and sharing the show it really helps the show get out there also if you are looking to expand the services that your shop offers and you want to do more than collision work you should really check out our company clarity coat Clarity Coat is a peelable paint that allows body shops to offer color changes cheaper than a repaint while still looking like real paint. You can also offer clear protection that has no edges and is sprayed instead of laid. Unlike vinyl and PPF, Clarity Coat can be sanded and polished, so you can give your customer the exact look that they are wanting. If you are looking to expand your shop's services, go to claritycoat.com and fill out our Become an Installer form. All right, let's get back to the show. So you are the type of guy that you want to way dive in deep, like to the deepest deeps that is out there and then cherry pick the information, simplify it down to um, deliver the best possible education and everything like that to the guy who, because I would, would you think it's fair to say that 90 to 95% of the guys that you run across every single day outside of this 20 group just want the shit to work and they don't really care to know most of the chemistry or anything like that. But when they run into a problem, you're now able to go back to this knowledge bank and say, okay, I know exactly why you're having this, this, and this problem. And then again, you can distill it down into some basic information of, well, this is why you're running into this problem. If you adjust these two, three things, then you're not going to have this problem anymore. And here's kind of the reason why. And then that's a hundred percent accurate. Is that um, fair to say? We, uh, I you're exactly right. Um, and like, I'll tell you how, I'll tell you how far I take this. So I did a class, um, we did a class on UV technology and the thing that I started researching 
was the individual paint companies and how they provide curing documentation for UV tech in different facets. Some of them then give the power of the light. Some of them give a distance. Some of them give a time. And I started to narrow this thing down to actual scientific measurements and terminology to make sure that whatever paint lines UV product you're using, I can take the light source that you're potentially thinking about using to cure, reverse engineer the data for it, and then tell you what distance and for how much time it takes to cure that individual product. And the reason I say it takes, like this is how far I go, is uh, my brother and sister-in-law are both engineers for Tesla. So when I get something that's like really out there, like, okay, these are like E equals MC squared type equations, like beyond my comprehension, I'll call them. And I'm like, look, okay, what does this actually mean? So this, um, this UV class I did, I called my sister-in-law because I started learning about this millijoules term, which is essentially, it's a transfer of energy over a, uh, over a footprint for a dictation of time. And I'm like, how do you, okay, I'm like, listen, Brie, I don't understand how to word this. Like word this to me like I'm in fifth grade because I can't wrap my head around it. So once she explained it to me, I was able to say, okay, this is how it works. Here's the, the, the equations it takes. This is how you do this. So then I built Excel programs to give to our guys in C20 that says, okay, if you have this specific, whatever your light brand is for UV cure, you put in these data points and then it's gonna sum up what your distance is and how long the cure time is gonna be. So to your point, a guy that doesn't know any of this stuff goes in, puts UV primer down, does a cure the way it says in the tech data sheets. And after the car is assembled, the UV primer starts peeling and he just wants to know why it's peeling. Well, I'm taking it to the point where we're not even gonna get there because let's do all the R and D ahead of time so that I know that if I'm going to use this UV primer with this particular tool, this is how I'm going to cure it. Um, so that's how far we take this stuff. It is the paint companies to their credit, they want to simplify it. And I get that. I mean, if you read a recipe to make a cake, it's going to tell you, okay, these are the eight steps to do it. They're not going to put in 27 steps uh, of measuring your oven temperature and checking how long it stays there for this period of time. We're doing that. We're taking it to the next level because in my opinion, some of this stuff that exists in, in the paint world and the chemistry world is just extremely advanced. So I want to go right between super high advanced and right between elementary and figure out how we make that the standard because the more a shop knows, the better they are. Like one of my favorite things is when you start talking about waterborne. Um, with waterborne, we solvent used to leave solvent. The solvents would, you know, leave, they would leave the film. We're dehydrating that base coat. Waterborne base coat needs to dehydrate. We need to whip the water away from it. So we did an entire class on the, on dehydration of waterborne base coat and what that looks like and what that means. So it's really just taking things um and and determining how far we we over we don't want to overcomplicate it because then nobody understands it um we take the overcomplicated data and then simplify that but go a couple steps above a regular tech data sheet uh i imagine that there are a lot of people listening right now that are just rolling their eyes and they're just like yeah jesus dude like just put the paint yeah. on the car and just and just bake the shit and then just call it a day. But I would, I would venture to guess this. Um, I don't look at stuff like this as necessarily useless information. I, for me personally, I, you get, to, you get to a point where like, there's kind of like a point of no return just with all knowledge and things. Right. Um, it's a bell curve, but what I find interesting is, most of the time when you come across people that have a very oh i i don't need to know about this like just whatever just put the stuff on the car just be done with it um they're also the ones that as soon as something doesn't work 
it's the product's fault or the, you can tell they get frustrated because they just they they don't have any idea why they're running into these issues and i think what's interesting is the people that do just even even if you were to go just a little bit below surface level and figure out stuff there is a whole bunch of combination of things and scenarios that you're gonna that you can have someone throw at you and you'd be like oh yeah i know that's why that's happening and then you've now become just god <laughs> like <laughs> you're just like the guy to go to and then it's just interesting because a lot of people would fix a lot of their issues if they would just dive a little bit more than surface level and dive into like how something works, why it works that way and everything. So with the, as an example, with this UV curing and everything, I would imagine, so obviously on the one end you have, okay, well, you didn't let it cure long enough or it improperly cured, so now it's peeling up. But then on the other end, the general fix to that for most people that I've run across is, okay, well then just throw it at it longer. Just, uh, it says to it says to do it for an hour. We're going to do it for four because more is better, right? And then what happens is four works and they're like, cool, I was right. I didn't, like, that was the fix. Bingo. But now you're talking Bingo. about inefficiencies, right? You're talking about three three hours that you it could have been it could have been something as simple as well actually you needed an hour and a half instead of just an hour because at that there's a critical point where it 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 gets to the point where it's it's now done and cured and now you can just leave it and all you needed was 30 minutes more but now you're you're two and a half hours inefficient and that in a in an industry in a service-based industry like what we're talking about it's just that's just an unacceptable level of inefficiency um so i always find it interesting that with any product out there and any process you're going to have especially in the united states um which you know we do have some international people but what people internationally need to understand is that the amount of variance there is in climate just in the united states would blow people's minds uh internationally anyways you have incredibly humid weather down south you have incredibly dry weather i don't know arizona arizona like uh in the southwest um incredibly dry blah 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 blah. but as for someone who dives just a little bit deeper than surface level you can make these small adjustments and say oh you've got 25 40 percent more humidity over here here's what you're going to have to account for and adjust for um uh, it, what's your, okay, what's your so I can give that? you an example of exactly what you just said, um, and this relates to every single person that paints a car in the United States of America. So one of the things that's that's happening is the paint company's cost to make chips, right? Chips that are supposed to match a formula or a variant is astronomical. The cost of chip production that are non-printed, that are sprayed, is absolutely unbearable. So the paint companies over the last several years have invested a ton of resource and a ton of time in spectrophotometer, or you can call it a color camera, and that technology. So that being said, the camera technology is so advanced right now that the vast majority of paint manufacturers, their end game is to get rid of color chips and to do 100% digital match. They can give you a better, faster match and give you a tool that they can update that is not an antiquated chip that costs a huge amount of money. You look at Tesla's, you can update that vehicle through your Wi-Fi, and it's more advanced than buying the next year model because I can do it like that. If I have to wait for variance chips four times a year, by the time I got the variance chip, it's already been out for three months. So this is where I'm going with this. If I look at the United States on a map and I look at Pittsburgh, if I look at Detroit, Michigan, if I look at 
Seattle, Washington, Miami, Florida. The climates and industries in those areas are so different that here is a huge thing that we teach in, in C20 or Finish in Collision Hub that the paint companies were like, oh, we actually didn't think about this. So we have a little known phenomenon where I live and in Detroit and a couple other areas called industrial fallout, rail dust. You cannot pick rail dust up with the naked eye, can't see it. The cameras, the way in which they're magnifying a pearl, a mica, a flake, a pigment is a hundred times more powerful than what you can see with your eyeball. So with that being said, if I have a car from 2018 where I live and I'm going to bring it in and I'm going to do the prep on the hood to do a camera shot, paint company says, tri-zact it, uh, polish it, um, glaze it, do your camera shot. That's fine if you're in Miami, Florida, but what if you're in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or Detroit where I now have a piece of metal particulate, most likely lots of them, AKA rail dust embedded in that paint. And I take a camera shot of it. The camera is going to pick it up. So what do I need to do if I'm in an area like that? I have to clay bar that car first. The spot that I'm going to camera shot, my first step needs to be clay bar to take the, I got to decontaminate that paint to take it back to OEM. Then I sand it, then I compound it, then I glaze it. Now I have a pure form OEM finish to take a camera shot of. It is proven over and over and over again that if you do that in an area like where I live, I'm not sure how it is where you live, um, where that is going to be a difference between a blendable match from a camera shot versus I'm gonna do a camera shot and then spend two hours tinning it. Because the industrial fallout, that's just one micro example of, of what can happen when we're not aware of our environment. If I take Miami, Florida, I got the same car from 2018 as that I do in, in Pennsylvania. The difference I have there is that I don't have industrial fallout, but I'm gonna have way more UV deterioration. So because of the environment that I'm in, I really need to look at these individual panels and look at my prep process differently than a guy in Pennsylvania or a guy in New York City. So the environment is huge, um, you know, and yeah, you talked about UV, absolutely. There's a, there's a shop out in Dallas, Texas because they have sun a lot all day long where they can cure their UV primers outside in about 25 minutes. And you can probably bet all your money on it that majority of days you're gonna be able to do that. Pennsylvania, we're gonna have a snow day or where you are in Dakota, snow day, overcast for a month. I can't, there's no way I can come up with a process for that. So the whole thing about this is about, is about building a process that's repeatable regardless of your weather conditions where you live, regardless of your environment, because we're all different. So if you're in Pennsylvania or Florida or Texas or Washington or Dakota or, or Michigan, do your process the same with every single car. And that way I don't worry about these little nuances because I'm going to take that vehicle back to OEM or I'm going to cure my product the same way every single time. Well, and not only that, but, you know, we've all seen the picture of like the silver chip on a silver car and they have like six of them right there. And they're just like, yeah. I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know which one this is supposed to be, you know, that type of thing. And so just from that one singular aspect like you're you're going to either fix or greatly reduce the chances of error on that but i'm just sitting here thinking to myself like the amount of data that um paint companies or well i'll just go off of paint companies are going to be able to pull from something like a camera is insane because what they're going to be able to do then is they're going to be able to so let's just say you know within let's say within the first three months of something like this coming out and going mass mass market, right? Within a couple of months, they're going to be able to say, okay, we had a hundred cars all over the U S that were the same make model, build time, everything like that. So you can make a relative statement that they were, they were basically the exact same panel all the way across the board. But when the shop up in Detroit 
painted um, painted it, it aired. There was there was this there was these errors that happened, and then when down in Miami there was these things that happened, and blah blah blah, and then you can start to build out a system where, when you put that camera on that panel, um, one it either gives you a procedure of, okay you live in the you live in the north um, north central northeast or central north I don't know what you guys would call it up there <laughs> sorry <laughs> the northeast uh, you guys live up here here's your steps that you have to do in order to prep this panel for this. Whereas down in Miami, um, okay, so you can make a fair statement that they have a lot of salt water, right? So maybe they want to do an acid bath exactly. previous to that to get rid of all the, um, all the salts, right? Um, so there's, there's your differences in prep depending on your shop, where you're located, and blah, blah, blah. But then also take a shot of that, and now it's going to spit out two different results for the northeast versus the um, south uh southeast florida you need a little bit more of this because you have a little bit more uv exposure and if you don't do it then maybe your whites are going to come out maybe just a tad more yellow than they're supposed to be because of whatever reason and then in the north um east you guys are going to have to do this this and this a little bit differently you can start to just like adjust these tiny little things over time to get a way better result and way better efficiencies which I don't know, for people that are thinking, like, man, you guys are, like, really overthinking this. <laughs> well, I mean, y you could make that argument, but I would rather, again, going back to, like, maybe it's the German in me, but I would just really would rather have something extremely efficient um, and not have to second-guess myself and know that it's done right versus sitting there scratching my head like i really don't know why this happened like this and this is really annoying to me and then yeah I and i think you know it's funny because like, I'm, I'm super german too and like i i um i work with the guys from sada a lot i mean i i, I um i've done a couple of videos with those guys just on air movers and um you know spray gun technology and they got a an incredibly incredibly smart group of guys that work for them um you know, I don't know if you could have a better team uh, for spray gun equipment than you do for what we have available through Dan Am um, with, with that SADA team. And um, I think that those guys are in that same, you know, school of thought where when you learn about the way that those guns are manufactured in Germany and you say, I don't understand, like, how is this gun $1,200? I would have questioned that myself 15 years ago. But now that I know the way those guns are machined and the fine tuning in them, and when you're talking about 0.001% differentiation because the complexity of paint finish and you got a 46V Mazda, you're gonna wish that you had your $1,000 gun that was built to do this as opposed to your Harbor Freight $200 gun and don't understand why the car is blotchy or why it's too dark because of the over-engineering that they're doing at at the spray gun level. Um, and, and I think that when you're over engineering it, we don't have to know all the specifics of, of the SADA measurements and, and all those things, but I wanna be confident that the company I'm buying from over engineered it so that when I go to do my job, it's simplified because they did all the hard work. And what we're trying to do is say, okay, the paint companies are do a great job. Every paint company out there does a good job with, with their information. I just want to say, you know what? Why don't we just take it one more step? Um, and that, like I said, the clay bar thing is a great example. Hey, I'm a rep for XYZ paint company. I predominantly do New York and Pennsylvania. And I'm going to make sure that my guys know, look, you know, we have rail dust, we have industrial fallout, we have all this stuff. Make sure you clay bar that car before you do this. Um, and then one of the things I'm a huge fan of is imagery. So like I have a, um, I have this magnifying glass um, or a magnifying glass, a, um, a, uh, a magnifying camera that I use to photograph panels at a super deep level. Like I think I'm taking them at like, it's a couple hundred X. So I'm able to take panels that you would say, oh yeah, like that looks good. I would camera shoot that. And I used a bunch of examples that show you that it's not even close to ready for a camera shot. But we have to understand that we cannot see that. So the average human being, and it's no fault of us, it's any paint wrap, a tech wrap, you or I would look at it and say, oh, absolutely, that thing's ready for a camera shot. Until I take and diagnose that thing deeper and say, whoa, 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 there's no way I can get a good reading on this because I compounded it and I have all these crazy 
uh, lines in it, the camera's gonna pick the lines up and it's gonna think it's either a uh, pearl, it's gonna think it's a, a metallic, it's gonna think it's something wrong with the panel and give me a poor match because I didn't understand what the camera was seeing. So we're trying to simplify, we're, we're overcomplicating it to simplify it. Yep, yeah. And your example about the guns, to me, what you're yes. doing there is you're eliminating variables. So uh, a lot of times for me, when it comes down to efficiencies, it's about eliminating variables. Um, so you have a piece of equipment that, you know, it's a good piece of equipment for about 70 to 80% of the time. But then that 20% of the time, it's something's off with it, which then makes you slower, which then makes you more frustrated, which then makes you less money. So if you're, if you're eliminating, like, okay, let's take the, let's take the camera as an example. 90% of the time, you might be able to get away with yep. not prepping the panel as good as you possibly could, right? And 90% of the time, you're probably going to be fine. Now what you're overconfident in is that because of that 90%, you're like, ah, yeah, Daniel, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm like, fuck that guy. But then you get that 10% where one out of a hundred jobs, you, you get a misreading, which means then you have to repaint the car, which means now you're eight, eight hours behind. And you've just, it, it just comes down to risk versus reward, right? You, you're going to get away with it a lot of the times, most likely. But then that one time that it doesn't, you don't get away with it. Was it, you just have to ask yourself, was it really worth that? Was it really worth you cutting, quote unquote, cutting that corner? If you want to, if you want to kind of label it that way. Um, yeah, man, very interesting stuff. And uh, probably have to have you back on the show at some point to talk, to go a little bit deeper into some of these topics, because I feel like we could probably just take a topic and then oh, just yeah, dissect yeah, it Oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> go from there. you know, they, this, um, this, stuff gets, this stuff gets super deep. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, do you ever hear the term sylvatochromatic? Do you ever, have you ever heard that term, sylvatochromatic? So basically what the term sylvatochromatic means is that um, if you take a pigment, it will change its color based on the liquid that you let it down with. So when I say let down, I mean reduce it with. So if I take a, a, a pigment and I reduce it out with uh, acetone, yeah, yeah. alcohol, um, water, gasoline, whatever, a liquid and, and, and reduce it out, it can have an impact on the way that the color, the final color appears. So there is this insane example of it that you'll, you'll never see this in collision repair, but there's, there is an element that exists called Brooker's marocyanine. And essentially what it is, is the most solvatochromatic uh, pigment that you could even see. So when you let it down with individual products, it will go from purple to yellow, to orange, to green, to red. I mean, it changes that much. So when, when I did this color class, wow. I said, look, this is not gonna happen in your, in your paint shop, but here's what you need to understand. What will happen is you have a, and this is kind of the engineering behind the education. So a paint rep comes in and you're using X brand of OEM approved paint and it's awesome. And that painter or owner decided that they were gonna use this cheaper reducer. Like, oh, well, the cheaper is 30 bucks. And this guy from so-and-so told me it's the exact same thing. And your reducer is $100. Okay, well, this is what we have to understand. That $100 reducer that was built to function with that paint the results are predictable. So if I take this unknown solvent that is supposed to be the exact same, if there's one difference in it and it reacts incorrectly to one of your pigments and you start having color issues, who is to blame? So it's just a little micro example of a paint company comes in and says, don't do this. And you say, why? And they say, because you're not supposed to. Well, I would rather tell you a super deep example of why. <laughs> Google Brooker's Marocyanine, look it up, and you'll be like, oh, wow, so that chromatic things are real. I probably shouldn't do this. Obviously, warranties and things like that, but you can, you can be more impactful with somebody using a visual than you can just saying, well, void your warranty. 
forget the warranty. I don't want to have to reshoot the side of a car. Yeah. Yeah, and I can tell you from experience that yeah. American <laughs> painters really don't I, like the answer. Trust me, bro, is probably the biggest thing. <laughs> and trust me, bro, is they, like the is like they the just term don't. now, right? Where'd you hear that at? Trust me, bro. No, let me just show you the facts. Like, let's just talk about the facts. They don't need to trust me. I'm just going to show you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Danny, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. I, I feel like I've just sat sat in class and just absorbed a ton of information. Um, is there anywhere there is there anywhere that uh, people can follow along with you and you have some of this info put out there? And, you know, I um, um people can just so like my Facebook it? is is you know pretty, uh, you know it's like it's personal. It's not not super uh, business related. Um, my our company Zimmerman Auto Body Supplies. Our Facebook there is 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 solid. Put a lot of information up there. Um, my Instagram tends to be a little bit more automotive related. My LinkedIn is is you know more networking things like that. But yeah, I mean, if you want to get super deep dive and you're a painter and you want to learn some of the stuff we're talking about, the Collision Hub C20 group, um, you know, that, that's where I would do all this stuff. And, uh, you know, the membership, I think it's like, I think they charge 50 bucks a month. It's like, it's a no brainer. Um, if anybody ever needs help, um, I'm always a, a, a social media message away. I never, never have an issue with um, talking to somebody over messenger if they need something. Perfect, man. Well, uh, guys, go hit up um Danian and check out his socials uh, check out that 20 group see dive into the rabbit hole and see what uh see what you can blow your mind with but uh yeah man really appreciate you coming on today and <laughs> spending some right. time with us blowing yeah. our minds melting mind i'm gonna have to go and just like i don't know, sit in a corner thanks adam appreciate it buddy. think about my life decisions <laughs> but uh yeah man i really appreciate you coming on this is the auto body podcast Presented by Clarity Code.